It was a day I'll never forget. The night before, I'd spent at a friend's house. We'd just completed the sixth grade. It was the first time in my life that we'd snuck out. And what we did when we snuck out was we went and we confiscated all the toilet paper that they had in their house. It was a simpler time. You now get shot for this. And we went and we found a friend's house. And we thought the best way to show our affection for them was to throw the toilet paper from another house into their trees, over their house, in their shrubs, and all over their lawn. But again, this was our first time. The end results left something to be desired. And yet, the euphoria of we had snuck out and we threw toilet paper in other people's trees was immense. And it was great. And we went back and we ate junk food all night and we stayed up and we got a couple hours of sleep when our bodies just shut down and refused to stay awake any longer. And then the next morning rolled around and we ate breakfast and then our parents picked us up. And I'll never forget this day. I was riding in the car with my father, and he had sports talk on the radio. And I look over, and all of a sudden, the window, which was next to me that was down, starts to go up. The radio's on, and he turns the radio station off. And I can't prove this, but I swear that the air conditioning was on, and he decided to turn that off, too. And I was trapped as the car was traveling about 40 miles an hour, and he looked at me, and he looked over, and he looked at me, and he looked over, and he looked at me, and he looked over, and he looked at me, and he looked over, and then he took a deep breath, and he said, son, you're going to start to notice some changes. And I said, please stop. Do not say anything else. He's like, well, son, your mother and I think it's time that I talk to you about some things that are going to happen in your life. And I said, Dad, don't. I said, there's nothing you can tell me that I don't already know. (laughs) Please, just don't. I know, I understand, we don't need to go any further right now. We're good. He said, well, if you ever have any questions, I said, I won't. (laughs) I won't. We we never need to discuss this topic ever again. He's like, well, your mother just really thinks it's, I'm like, we're good. You good. I'm good. We're good. Then the air conditioning came back on. The windows were rolled back down. And I wanted to act like a dog and just stick my head out the window and feel some fresh air all, all over again because it was, it was over, but it was scarring, man. It was scarring. There's just some things that I never wanted to talk about my parents with. And I was like, I never wanted to have the sex talk with my dad. And now that I'm on the other side as a parent, I get for as awful as that felt for me to be in that car... That poor man was, was going through all of that and more. As he's like, here's his kid who's 11 or 12 years old, and he's like, I don't want to talk about this with my kid. And, and yet, I, I probably should because I'm his parent. And, and we're just we're going to talk about relationships and family dynamics over the course of the next few weeks. And we're going to start here today just understanding that relationships are hard. Dating is hard. Marriage is hard. Wanting to date and not having anybody to date is hard. Regardless of where you find yourself in the spectrum, relationships are difficult and they're hard. And sometimes they cause us to do some really stupid things that if we were thinking more clearly, we'd never do. And sometimes they cause us to do some really awesome things that if we were thinking more clearly, we would never have the guts to do. And, and it's just all of this. And I want you to know, you're not alone and it's nothing new. It's nothing new. A couple thousand years ago, there was a church that was pretty messed up. They, they were in a city called Corinth, and they, they were messed up. They had a lot of issues, and they had a lot of spiritual wisdom and spiritual guidance given to them by a guy named the Apostle Paul. Now, under the guidance of God, he wrote to them two letters that we have in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. And this morning, we're going to look at part of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. But historically, understand the thoughts on sex, especially in our society, have been this. There are two extremes. You can either be a pervert where everything goes, or you can be a prude 
where you don't want to talk about sex and just, oh, sex is a dirty word. And really, that's what our culture holds up as the only two options. You can be a complete pervert or you can be an absolute prude. And what we're going to see is there's a healthier way. And what we're going to see is that sex is part of God's design. It isn't wrong. It isn't dirty. It isn't something that we shouldn't talk about. And yet, we have to understand that there are, there are ramifications and dynamics that we need to operate within. And that's what we're going to look at today. So 1 Corinthians 7, starting in verse 1, you can follow along on your Bible apps, on your phones or tablets, or on the screens. We read this. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote... It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Now, fellas, don't freak out, all right? Because I understand if I'm coming in to Lakeside for one of the first times, and I'm like, I'm going to check out this church, and the first thing I hear is it's good not to have sex with a woman. I'm like, that, cross that church off the list. That's not going to work for me. Yeah, we're good. Nope, let's find somewhere else, baby. Now, understand, understand that Paul is talking right here to single individuals. And he's getting their attention, because if he's, if he's writing to somebody, it's okay to be single, what are you going to do? You're going to gloss that over, that's boring, all right, yeah, okay, it's okay to be single, yeah, we know that, great. But as soon as he introduces the sexual dynamic, all of a sudden, the attention is there. The attention is there. So what, he, he, what he's saying here is a message geared towards single people. And what he's saying is, it's good to be single. It's good to be single. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is, do we really believe this? Do we really believe in our culture, in our society? Is, do we really think it's okay to be single? Because the mes- message of our culture and the attitudes in our cult- culture towards singleness are very different than this idea. You, you see it everywhere. You see it with Bumble and Tinder. They tell you constantly, you need to have a relationship, you need to have that dynamic in your life, you need to have companionship, you're not enough if you're alone. That's the message of our culture. And then they, it's played out for all of us to see, sometimes on massive scales, in The Bachelor and The Bachelorette, which don't get me wrong, guilty pleasure, all right, I understand, and you're like, I'm so glad I'm not that guy who would do that. And yes, I'm sure you're so heartbroken that the man that you've decided in the two weeks of filming the show that is your soulmate and you love more than anyone else, and oh, by the way, you're okay with him going out with dates with six other women an hour before he goes out with you, but then on your date, you're just torn up with the fact that he's going out with six other women, but you signed up on the show to be with 25 other women. And just the angst and the anguish that that brings about is fun to watch. I understand that. But this idea in our culture, in our society, it goes to so many areas. And it's, it's subtle, but it says, if you're single, there's something missing. If you're single, you're not enough. And honestly, this has crept into the church as well. And so I just want to encourage you, if you are here and if you are single, there is nothing wrong with you. There is, you're not missing some great, you're not less of a person. You are loved, you are valued, you are accepted, you are welcome. And honestly, your life is going to be easier than my life. There is nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you. And embrace that fact and accept it. And so as a church, we need to stop this idea that if somebody's single, that they're not enough. And sometimes what can happen is because we're happy in our relationships, we think everybody else needs to have a relationship in order to be just like me. And so we see said single person. And then we, said, then we see another single person. And without thinking about any of the ramifications, we're like, hey, have you thought about dating so-and-so? Never mind the fact we don't know if said person's attracted to so-and-so. Never mind the fact we don't know if they're going to be a good match, if they're going to like spending time together. We just see it and we're like, hey, you're single and they're single? I think you'd be a great match. Now, I didn't get married until I was 27, which in the Midwest, I know for some people is like, wow, that's really late. In California, they're like, why'd you get married so soon? But it just, so some of that just depends on where you grew up. I was single in a church for a while. And so some people would say, hey, you and -and so-and-so would be a great match. 
Yeah, if you're Satan, that would be a horrible match. No, thank you. Like, why would, what have I done to you that you would wish this upon me? Why would you, like, I thought we were friends. I thought we cared about each other. No, this would not be a good fit. This would not be a good match. And so just, just please, I know you mean well, but unless you're a really good friend, unless you understand the dynamic, and unless they've invited you to help them in this area, just stop. Just stop. They got it. And if they come to you and they're like, hey, little buddy, I need some help, then by all means, by all means. But other than that, just stay out of their business and understand that there's not something wrong with somebody if they're single. They're okay. And because you're happy one way doesn't mean that everybody else has to be that way in order to be happy. So let's just make sure as Lakeside that we're not going to treat people differently if they're married or if they're single or where they are in the spectrum, but we're going to understand that marriage, it isn't for everybody. And honestly, if you're not married, your life is going to be easier. And then Paul continues, where a lot of people are, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. God's designed us as as humans, as individuals, and he's given us sexual desires. Sex is a gift. It's given to us by God. And the reality is, so so much of our lives, especially if we're trying to honor God in our sexuality, we we can have so many, so many just messages that get messed up in our head, and, and just this, we have physical desires which God has designed us to enjoy and to have on one hand and yet on the other hand there's this desire to do what's right and so how do how do we make sure that at all times we're we're doing both of those things and how do we make sure that God's desire for our conduct and God's desire for our lives wins out over our physical desires when our physical desires don't align with God's intention and God's desires for our life and one of the first things that we have to do, especially when, when we're growing up, is we have to embrace the fact that God has designed us as sexual people. We just have to understand that this isn't, this isn't some flaw in, in our DNA. God has designed us to desire and to enjoy sex. And yet, within that desire, we have to understand that we have to operate within the design of the Creator. That our desires are never more important than God's desires for us. Our desires are natural, but our desires are never more important than God's design for us. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Now, husbands, I know you're highlighting it right now in the Bible app, but I'm just going to warn you, be careful, all right? Just be careful. This may become your life verse, and I understand that, all right? If you're like, John 3, 16 is great and all, but 1 Corinthians 7, 4 is the verse for me. I understand if you're like thinking, all right, this is going to be my new life verse. Just be careful, because she's not going to find it nearly as humorous as you do, all right? So just throwing out that disclaimer and that caution. But what we see here, what we see here is this whole idea of sex This whole idea of sex is introduced to us not as a privilege, but as an actual right that happens within marriage. An actual right. That sex is designed to be an integral part of your marriage relationship. God never designed sexless marriages. That goes counterintuitive to God's design. That's not the design. And so he says the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. And so what we understand and what we see here is the pleasure of the partner is paramount. The pleasure of the partner is absolutely paramount. If you are going to operate in in conjunction with one another. If you are going to be 
synchronized in how you operate within your relationship, you have to stop looking towards your own needs. You have to stop constantly elevating what you want and what you desire. And your focus needs to be on the needs and the desires of your spouse. That you no longer are the focus, but your spouse's needs and your spouse's desires. That is the focus. That is what drives you. The pleasure of your partner is paramount. And this is also an invitation for us within marriage to completely give away ourselves. And one of the greatest things that can prohibit this is when we're in our own minds and when we're stuck on our own hang-ups, when we don't have a proper self-image, when we don't like things about ourselves and we allow that to just drive all of the discussion, we allow that to become our focus. And when we can't get out of our own way because we're constantly thinking about the things that we don't like about ourselves and we allow that to become our focus, that has negative effects in our marriage relationships. And so we need to make sure that the pleasure of our spouse is paramount and we need to completely give ourselves away. It isn't about what I want and what I desire, but my wants and my desires are now what my wife wants and what she desires. And my wife's desires aren't what she wants, but what I want. And this is how the relationship operates at its best, when we elevate the needs of the other and we diminish our own It says this, do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. And so here he just continues this theme that God didn't design sexless marriages. An author and therapist, Christine Gallagher, wrote an article a few years ago in the Huffington Post entitled, Seven Ways Sex Can Kill a Marriage. Seven Ways Sex Can Kill a Marriage. This is what she wrote. Can sex kill a marriage? Absolutely. Problems in the bedroom can lead to deep dissatisfaction. A marital sex problem is like a canary in a coal mine, a warning alarm that danger lies ahead. Number one, the first danger, is when one spouse controls the frequency of sex, when one spouse controls when it's going to happen. Number two, when spouses withhold sex. When they treat sex as a weapon or a reward system, that is when sex can kill a marriage. Number three, a sexless marriage. 15% of marriages haven't been intimate in six months to one year. Number four, spouses constantly complain that they're too busy or they're too tired. Number five, when a spouse is addicted to porn. Number six, a spouse dislikes sex with their partner. And number seven, a cheating spouse. These are the seven ways that sex can kill a marriage. And you know what the theme is amongst all of them? I'll read them again and look for the theme. Number one, when one spouse controls the frequency. Number two, when a spouse withholds sex. Number three, when it's an entirely sexless marriage. Number four, when a spouse constantly complains that they're too tired, too busy. Number five, when a spouse is in when a spouse is addicted to porn. Number six, when spouses dislike sex with their partner. And number seven, when a spouse cheats. You know what the theme is? Selfishness. It's selfishness. When it says that my desires are more important than your desires. That's the theme that runs through all seven of those areas where sex can absolutely kill a relationship. And so Paul offers a disclaimer, and he says, if you're not being intimate with your spouse, if you're not being intimate with your spouse, it needs to be short, and it needs to be spiritual. It needs to be, it needs to be short, a predetermined amount of length of time. It needs to be short, and it needs to be for a spiritual reason. And then you need to come back together and enjoy one another. You need to come back together and be united together. You need to come back together and be together. The only reason that Paul says here is if, if it's short and if it's spiritual. Now, we understand that there are health concerns that happen within relationships. And we're certainly not saying that there are no other reasons that a, that a marriage should 
should not have a frequency of intimacy that brings fulfillment and enjoyment to partners. We understand that, that there are other dynamics, but what we're talking about here is when it's the intent. When it's the intent. And the intent, it better be short and it better be spiritual. And then you need to come back together and you need to be unified and you need to be joined together. Then Paul says this. Now, as a concession, not a command, I say this. He says this as a concession, not a command. Meaning, you don't have to get married. You don't have to get married. But because he understands that people have sexual desires, and because he understands that the sexual desires of people are so strong that if they're going to give in to those, this is how it needs to be done. And then he says, I wish that all were as I myself am. Single. But each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. Listen, he says, I wish everybody was the way I am. Why? Because he understands it's easier if you're single. Let's just, let's just be honest. If you're single, there are times where it is difficult. In fact, this week coming up may be one of those times. And we understand for you that this week can be incredibly, incredibly hard. And you see all the commercials. And you, see, you just see all the social media posts. You can't escape it. They've got the romantic comedies playing in the theater right now. Everything's geared. Uh, every ad campaign's all about Valentine's Day. It's all about buying your love. Everything, every place you go for dinner's running a Valentine's special. It's everywhere. And it can be hard, especially if you're in the state of life where you're single and you wish you were married. It can be really, really difficult this week. I want to encourage you, hang in there. We understand this week can be hard. You might want to eat your feelings, and then when you try to do that, you got to get, what, a heart-shaped box of chocolates? Oh, that's fun. Or you're like, I'll, I'll get pizza, and then it's a heart-shaped pizza, and you're like, would you just stop, please? We understand it can be really difficult, but I promise you this, and if you're young, please listen to me. It is always better to be single wishing you were married than married wishing you were single. Because it will ruin your life. It is always better to be single wishing you were married than married wishing you were single. And so if you're there, and if this week's going to be really hard for you, don't do anything you regret. Don't act foolishly. Be responsible and understand. In a week or so, all the heart-shaped candy will be gone. The pizzas will be back to the way they should be. You're not going to have to see the romantic comedies everywhere. And the dinner specials will be back to normal. Get together with a couple good friends. Talk about how much you hate boys or how awful women are. And you don't really mean it. And then just blow off some steam for a night. And just get through. But don't hook up on Tinder or something else because you're lonely. And don't run into a relationship because you're lonely. Be careful. Guard your heart and understand it can be difficult. But it's always, always, always better to be single wishing you were married than married wishing you were single. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Stay single if you can. There's nothing wrong with it. Stay single if you can. If you can't control yourself. If you can't control yourself, then you need to look at, at a relationship. Sex is designed to take place within a relationship. And within a relationship that is permanent and private. 
And the reason for that is because our sexual desires are so strong. This is an area that will absolutely destroy your life. It will consume you. It will ruin relationships. It will destroy others. This is an area that needs to be done according to God's plan because it is so incredibly powerful. It's so incredibly powerful powerful. And God has given us the design, but we have to operate within that design. And the design that God has given us is that sex is to happen within marriage. Marriage is to be permanent, and it's to be private. And because sex is such a gloriously wonderful and powerful thing, it has to be contained. And it has to be contained within that relationship. Otherwise, it will destroy you as few other things can. And we've seen the stories. And some of you live with the scars of what happens when desire goes outside of God's design. And it has implications on people you love. It has implications on you. And it can haunt us in ways few other things can. And so I am begging you, make sure that you honor God in this area of your life. Make sure that you follow God's design. To the married, I give this charge. Not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband. But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife. And so here in the midst of this discussion about the benefits of sex, about how we need to operate within our relationships sexually with one another, about how the needs of our spouse needs to be paramount, and how I don't own my own body, but my wife owns my body, and my wife doesn't own her body, but I own her body. And in the midst of all of this discussion that's going on, of how good singleness is and how, how people should operate within their sexual relationships, out of all of this, then there's this idea of divorce that's mentioned. And the question is why? Why does Paul, under the guidance of God's inspiration, link this idea of separation and divorce to sex? Why? Why? And here's the answer. Because sex is the greatest indicator of your relational health. Sex is the greatest indicator of your relational health. Listen to me. Those of you who are married understand this. Sex will be your security in your relationship or it will be your separation. Sex will be your security or it will be your separation. It will bring you together closer than you have ever been with anybody else as God designed marriage to be. That two people come together and they operate together as one. And it will mold you and hold you together. Or it will drive you apart faster than anything. Sex will be your security or your separation. And the question is, how will we respond? If you're single, understand there is nothing wrong with you. You are enough. You are complete. Not everyone needs to be married. Take your time. Make sure you get it right. So many people stick together in bad dating relationships because they just feel like we just need to make it work. We need to make it work. And yet the, something really weird happens then in our culture that as soon as they get married, the same couple that's, that tried so hard to make it work is so quick to throw in the towel and quit. It's backwards. 
If you're dating somebody and there are red flags, break up and be done. Don't force something to work in the dating stage. When it's time to force something to work is when you say I do and you've pledged to spend the rest of your life with somebody and you see all their ugly that they kept hidden for you for a long time, all through dating, all through engagement, all through the first six to eight to nine months of marriage, and then the ugly just starts coming out and you're like, oh man, you kind of are like your mother. And she's looking at you like, oh, you're exactly like your dad. What did I do? That's the time to fight. That's the time to stick together. That's the time where you realize, oh, this isn't going to be easy. Not when you're single. Not when you're dating. So if there are red flags in your relationship, you deal with them. And if you can't get closure, and if you can't work beyond those, break up. There's nothing wrong with that. Take your time. It's always better to be single wishing you were married than married wishing you were single. And once you're married, you need to understand that this is a commitment that by design, by God's design, is to be lifelong. And within that commitment, you are to operate as one. And within that context, and within that content, within that commitment, within those parameters, you are to enjoy God's gift of sex. And allow it to be something that brings you together. Not something that tears you apart. That the needs and the desires of your spouse are paramount. They're more important than your own. And you give yourself freely and completely. Because sex is your security or it will be your separation in your relationship. Because that's how God designed us. The question is, will we be faithful? And will we operate and enjoy this gift within the parameters God has given us? God, I pray for the people here who are single. Lord, I know this week can be incredibly difficult. And so I just pray that you would would just encourage their hearts. God, that they would embrace where they are in life not worried that they aren't enough, not feeling like they have to do something else, but just accept it and even enjoy it. God, I pray for the people here who are engaged, and I pray, God, that you'd give them wisdom. I pray that they would deal with things that they need to deal with in their relationship, and they would make sure that they are on the same page. And God, I pray for the people here who are married. Lord, I pray that our marriages would be a reflection of our love for you. I pray that we would operate within the confines that you've given us. God, that we would be wise. That our conduct would bring you glory. And that we would operate within the design of our creator. That sex would be permanent and it would be private. With our spouse and only our spouse. And God, that you would bring fulfillment and joy in our marriages. So help us. And whatever, whatever stage of the relationship dynamic we're in now, help us honor you. We ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen.